Jimmy Kowalski. The sun is down, the street lights are on, and you're listening to Largely the Truth with Brennan Store. To all you restless sleepers and midnight creepers, bleary-eyed truckers in the graveyard shift, this is Brennan Store, and you're listening to Largely the Truth. Whether you're staring at a screen or the lines on the road, all is well, and for the next little while it's going to stay that way. Because I'm here, you're there, and together we're going to explore the night. Well, hello there. My name is Brennan Store. You are listening to my podcast, Largely the Truth, and I welcome you to my very first episode. If you're coming from one of my other projects, you may know me. If you don't, I'm one of the founding hosts of the Ghost Story Guys podcast. We're still running strong over at ghoststoryguys.com, everywhere. Find podcasts live. I've been doing that for the last four years, telling stories of the strange and unusual, and it is near and dear to my heart. But sometimes there are conversations you want to have that are outside the box of what you normally do, And this show is very much that. Largely the Truth is my opportunity to interview some of the most interesting people I can find and have the sort of conversations that, well, they're worth staying up for. To to give you an example of what I'm shooting for here, years ago, I rolled into El Paso, Texas at about 1030 at night on a Greyhound bus, which I I don't recommend you do. I had arrived from uh, Austin and left much earlier in the day. And I had been hooked up with a place to stay by some lovely folks I met on Couchsurfing. This is, again, a long time ago. I don't know if Couchsurfing is still around. I assume it is, but who knows. The fellow I was staying with in El Paso was not part of the network. He was a friend of the people I had met on the network. His name was Bob. And Bob was a historian in El Paso, and he's a retired guy who had a spare room and some time to show a clueless young man around the city and eventually Juarez, Mexico, which that's a story for another time. So Bob picked me up at the bus station, we hit it off famously, and we sat on his porch talking until the sun came up. I think we finally went to bed about 4.30, quarter to 5 in the morning. And that was one of the greatest nights of my life, just because there is nothing, nothing like a conversation so good, you're willing to forsake everything else to keep it going. Sleep, work, all that nonsense. That is the shit I live for, and so with Largely the Truth, my new bi-weekly podcast, that is what I hope to bring to you. I am out in search of the most fascinating people I can find to share their perspectives with me, artists, musicians, activists, anyone who's got something interesting to say. I want to meet them, I want to talk to them, and folks, I want to bring them to you. So whether you know me from the Ghost Story Guys, or whether you know me from my book, A Strange Little Place, or some of the other podcasts I've done guest spots on, or whether you're just randomly finding this online, which is wonderful, welcome to the party, welcome to the show. I truly hope you stick around, because I think we're going to go some fascinating places. My very first interview is with the Miami-based artist Darko Richards. Darko is an extraordinarily talented producer of sort of cinematic electronic rock. It's it's a whole genre unto itself. Really great, great stuff. And Darko and I talked for almost an hour about not only his Darko Richards project, but many of his other side projects, and just the sort of the, the current state of independent music as it stands. So it's time now to reach out to my good friend, Darko Richards. And I'll be back at the end of the interview to see you off into the night. My guest tonight, my first guest, on this version of Largely the Truth, in fact, is someone who came to my attention when his album, A Point of Departure, was named one of the best synth albums of 2017. Uh, Who named it that, I don't remember. But whoever they were, they were right. And I've been a fan since. And he's an extraordinarily versatile composer, producer, performer, and, and really just an overall good dude. And his latest album, The Wicked, will be out by the time you hear this. He is Darko Richards. Darko, welcome to Largely the Truth. Thank you so much, Brian. I appreciate the kind words. That's a beautiful intro. And I honestly have forgotten about that article, uh, back from Point of Departure, that named that. 
now after we have this conversation, I want to have to remember myself and find out who named it that. <laughs> but that was nice. That was that was a good day. That was a good day. Yeah, absolutely. I, I found you and I found the retroglyphs from that okay. uh, that list. Well, actually, we'll talk about Point of Departure because that is mm-hmm. that is uh, you say that was your first album, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. Perfect. And and that is undergoing a transformation. But but we'll we'll get there. Why don't you just tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and the kind of music you make? Okay. Well, I mean, I've definitely always been in love with music. That's kind of obvious for any music producer, <laughs> right. kind of junkie uh, in that sense. As far as the music that I do under the name Darko Richards, I have settled after some time of figuring out what's the best way to make my music on cinematic electronic rock. I would oh, love okay. to just have one word that would describe it, right? The, the shorter, the, the better. Of course. But three words is as short as I can get that um, because... Whether I'm trying or not, my music is definitely very cinematic. That's not even my opinion. That's just the feedback I always get. Absolutely. Uh, I definitely cannot get the rock out of me. <laughs> and it's definitely electronic. So I'll settle for cinematic electro- electro- electronic rock or electro rock, whatever you want to do. And, I, you know, I tap into different things. I remember, you know, Point of Departure, I was trying to do kind of a synth wave thing. But again, my, my influences on rock and cinematic influences are probably a little too strong. And right. ended up being, I, I am what I am, basically. As someone who struggles to be sort of summed up in, in one or two words or even one or two sentences sometimes, I sympathize. I sympathize. <laughs> okay. You hear me. Yeah. 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 A thousand percent. So when did you first discover that you loved music? Because obviously this is, a, this is a lifelong thing for you. Well, I mean, I, I can go as far as I, my memory allows me for loving music, right? right. Uh, as a child, just around, you know, the room of being attracted to certain um, artists and whatnot. However, it wasn't until I was, I want to say 14-ish, 14, definitely by 15, where it wasn't just I love music, is I have to do music. This is it. Whether I want to or not, I'm not going to be able to get this out of my system. This has to happen moving forward. And I um, kind of haven't looked back ever since and have been trying to do, uh, to compose music ever since. So that's really when it took over. Uh, I fell in love with the guitar originally. I'm originally a guitar player. Right. Right. Um, as a teenager, I probably wanted to be Slash. Right. Like a lot of teenagers. <laughs> who who doesn't? I didn't even right. play guitar. I wanted to be Slash. <laughs> right. Right. So that was kind of the original idea. The, the, the first love was the guitar. Right. To this day, I still love her. Um, but over time, I realized I was more of a composer than a guitar player alone. If that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, and it wasn't really on, on, only up to about a few years ago, Point of Departure being the first full attempt, that I realized, wait a minute, I should just be here. Technology these days allows someone like myself to compose a lot, even just alone in a room, right? Sure. Where maybe, you know, decades ago uh, or before any time in you know, history before that, you needed X amount of real human beings to play whatever you write. Well, these days you can kind of get away with this stuff right here. And you're not getting me out of here, basically. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> oh, I, I'm glad because, like I said, I'm, I'm a fan of your stuff. I mean, Point of Departure, uh, again, love that. And then you really evolved. And that's actually been something I've, I've really enjoyed watching is how much you've evolved over the course of the, the four years I've been following your music. Because, mm. you know, as we discussed, uh, Point of Departure is, is your first record. And, mm-hmm. you know, you've, you've revisited that recently. And Mm -hmm. you've sort of found some, uh, you know, it it doesn't necessarily hold up to your your present standards. And again, we'll we'll talk about Mm -hmm. that in a little bit. But from there, you took that and then you made uh, the um, Into Orbit, I believe was the next record, Mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, you got it right. That was such a, again, such a a departure and such an evolution (laughs) in terms of like that really hard driving electronic style. And now with The Wicked, it's, it's, Mm -hmm. it's almost like a synthesis of some of the different projects you've been working on. Because you've got, you know, the hard driving of Into Orbit. There's a little bit of that, that uh, point of departure, kind of big, big mm-hmm. soundscape stuff going on. But you've also mm-hmm. kind of incorporated the influences from some of your other projects, which again, I really want to talk about at least some of the, uh, mm-hmm. the more community-based projects you've got going on. And mm-hmm. is that an intentional thing or is that just sort of a, this happens no matter what you're doing if you're growing as an artist? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I actually appreciate you you were right on a lot of that. Like, like you're really paying attention and that means a lot. <laughs> so oh, like yeah. myself, you got, you got a lot of that, right? Um, now it's interesting because I'll tell you what happened with, with this last album and, you know, 
the point you're trying to make about the development um, of the sound changing over the three albums, actually Point of Departure, first of all, was called that because for me, it was a departure from, again, being a guitar player. So kind of tying it to uh, the previous course, right. point where, okay, I'm departing from being the guitar player in a rock band to I'm going to be a, a producer doing cinematic electronic stuff in a, in a studio. But then after that, um, to be honest with you, in, into Orbit, the second album, and then The Wicked, this new album that's coming out next week, were written together, right? Oh, they interesting. Were supposed, yeah, they were supposed to be the second album, period, right? So I said, okay, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write the second album. I spent X amount of months, um, this was two years ago, 20, 2019, I suppose, composing, I don't know, 18, 19 tracks. And then the idea was, okay, I'm doing 18, 18 tracks, I'll pick the best 10 and 11, releases as an album. And the others won't make it, right? Which was right. definitely a case of point of departure. And that's what happens a lot of the times. Well, I kind of, two things happened. One, I kind of loved them all. <laughs> and I couldn't <laughs> find myself to, to eliminate a lot of them. Right. And narrow it down to 11, 12 tracks. Number two, I realized I have two main themes here. Um, that was not on purpose. It's not like I sat down and said, I'm going to write 18 songs over the next uh, few months about two main theme, themes. But that's what happened, things that were just happening in my life. And then I realized, you know what? If I kind of split this in half, I have a lot of songs about this here. This feels coherent into right. orbit. And then the other half, this feels coherent, the wicked. And it just kind of naturally arrived there. I released into orbit first. Um, and then other things happened with my other projects, which I'll be more than happy to talk to you about if you want to. It sounds like you want to go uh, and touch on those too. So some time, there was some time between Into Orbit and The Wicked. And when it came now time to release The Wicked, I was not fully satisfied where I left those songs. Right. So uh, to be honest with you, I kind of worked on a lot of them a lot. And they came a long way from the work two years ago. But yes, they were born two years ago, along with the tracks from Into Orbit. Interesting. That's a long answer, but that's kind of what happened. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm all about the long answer, my friend. So you said there's, there's two, different the or two different themes each one sort of had. What would you say the themes of Into Orbit and The Wicked are? I would say, and this is an oversimplification, Into Orbit is a lot about my own love for music. It's, it's literally songs okay. about, I love you music, and I'm going to keep doing this till I die. That's, again, right. an oversimplification. Maybe it sounds a little corny. Um, Not at all. So yeah, Into Orbit is mostly about that. Now, The Wicked, <laughs> uh, that one, I don't know how much I want to get into, to be honest with you. <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah, whatever you're comfortable yeah, with. Yeah, yeah. Which, which is kind of a, it's an awkward place, I think, for musicians and artists to be where like you have the stuff you need to get out of your system. Yep. Here it is. And then, hey, what is it about? I don't really want to talk about it all that much. <laughs> but <laughs> one thing that I think is helpful for me as an artist, uh, the type of music that I do as Darko Richards, is that a lot of it is instrumental. Right. Which for me, you get to, for me personally, I'm one of those that I feel that music says a lot more than words. I'm never, even when I'm listening to music full of lyrics, I'm the guy paying attention to the music and the production behind it, not the lyrics. Right. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, I kind of got a lot of stuff that I needed to get out of my system um, in an instrumental way. Now, the main theme, I, I kind of turned into this sort of um, concept album, believe it or not. Oh, okay. um, where, yeah, where I kind of got to take it away from me and you have this little story about this uh, individual who falls into some sort of spell. Very traditional. Honestly, actually, you, you would have probably appreciated due to your sensibilities and things that you like to do with your shows. But let's just say an individual falls into a spell and we find him in a journey trying to get out of the spell. And by the end of the album, he thinks he's out of the spell. That's as best as I can put it. Okay. Again, it might all be in my head. Maybe the listener won't receive that because it's all instrumental, right? So you're right. welcome to project whatever's inside your head when you're listening to the album. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, interesting. <laughs> the mystery deepens. <laughs> uh, I think that's as far as I want to go there. But I think I think if you pay attention and you look uh, and you listen to it, I do, you know, one thing that I like to do, this is kind of a, a, a technique that is kind of uh, outdated now, I believe. I don't, I don't see a lot of artists doing it. I do like to use voiceovers, whether from movies or I'll, I'll literally get a book on audio because it's set a line and it might have anything to do with the rest of the book, but it serves my purpose for Absolutely. the message I, I want to send in the song. And then that helps, I think, in a verbal sense, get the message across, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, um, there's an artist called Electus and mm -hmm. uh, his song, Who We Are, 
has this really great um, outro, which is all vocal. It's all this, I don't know where it's from, but it's very evocative. Mm-hmm. And uh, Shannon Legro from the podcast Into the Fray Radio, that's her, that's her uh, outro music, is that whole bit. And it, it, yeah, as you say, it, mm-hmm. it doesn't directly address, but it, it, it says enough that you, you understand what, uh, what's being put across. So I noticed on, on the Wicked, uh, and there are vocals. Mm-hmm. And well, track, track four, mine, has full-on vocals, right, by a, by a, a good friend of mine and singer, Cassandra Lark. I was going to ask if it was Cassandra. I, I... Yeah, yeah, it's Cassandra. Oh, you know what? You're right, because I sent you the album, but it doesn't say in, in the private uh, link that I sent you that it is Cassandra on that track. So it is Cassandra Lark, yes. Very, very talented vocalist. And folks, if you haven't heard her debut album, Star 69, I recommend you check it out. It's on Bandcamp. Produced by yours truly, by the way. I was just about to ask if you produced it. I wasn't sure. I checked the credits before yeah, yeah. We, before I, the call, but I didn't see it on there. Yeah, you know, yeah. It definitely has your mark. There's that one track um, I always used to send people, Nanny Doss. And that, <laughs> just a hell of a song. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's, I believe that's her favorite as well, her personal favorite. Was that also part of the... Uh, because is I, if I'm thinking correctly, there's no singing on Into Orbit or Point of Departure? No, actually, in um, Point of Departure, again, this is years ago, um, Cassandra's in three songs in that album. Oh, of course. Now, yes, it, pardon me. It, 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 no, no, no. Well, no worries. It's a, it is an 11-song album, so eight of them don't have vocals. It is right. mostly instrumental. Right. Uh, but she is on three of them. In Into Orbit, there is no vocals. You're absolutely correct. Right. Uh, seven instrumental tracks. It, not really by design. Um, just kind of happened that way. Like I said, it was kind of after the mat. The fact I think these seven songs go together, they just don't happen to have vocals. Okay. And in this one, there was one, uh, with vocals. I actually, um, I have, I, I don't write lyrics. I don't sing, et cetera. Right. Right. And I have never, ever once told a singer, write a song or come, you know, lay vocals on my track about a certain topic or theme. But in this case, because the album does have, like I said, a, a sort of concept, Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, this is the first time I found myself asking a singer in the state of San Diego, Hey, I kind of need you to write a song. I'm not going to write the lyrics for you. You're she's great at it. I'm not. So I wouldn't even try, yep, fair. To, but I need you to keep it within this box here as, 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 you know, as far as the message, the theme of the song. And of course she killed it. She said everything that I could have hoped for and more, uh, to fit where that song falls in the album and, and the story that's being told in the album. Since uh, we're talking about vocalists, we're talking about uh, the very talented Cassandra Lark, your music is sort of, it was interesting to me for a lot of reasons, but particularly because many of the independent musicians I've spoken to struggle to build community around themselves. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't know if that's because of that sort of crabs in a bucket mentality of show business. You know, you're afraid to get too close to anyone because, you know, maybe their success costs you something. I, I don't know. But that seems to be um, something you've avoided because you, you have really, with your various projects, um, Chuparuba, My Only Other One, My Friends and I, you've really kind of built, a, it seems like a, a really a nice little community of very, very talented people around you. And uh, how, yeah. can you talk a little bit about how you've managed to do that? You know, it's a beautiful thing in my case um, because although I can be as many um, producers, at least in my line of uh, or style of music, we tend to be introverts and kind of loners. And I just want to be here doing music. Sure. Um, if I could do this from in here and just throw it out there and never go out there, I'll be fine. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm not the biggest uh, extrovert to go out to bars and clubs and meet other people. I'm not that guy. Right. Which, by the way, is probably something I should do a little more of just for networking purposes. But anyways, I hear you. in my case, it's not me reaching out, trying to establish communication with these artists. I am very happy, fortunate um, to say that these artists, Cassandra Lark, um, my Shermani from Chuparuba, Alice is from my only other one. And then my friends and I, it's literally about uh, working with other musicians. For right. the most part, these are all people I've had in my life for literally years and in some cases almost decades now oh wow so okay. yeah yeah like uh and i can get more spe- specifics about each one of them but these are basically great friends of mine people who i love beyond music and so i'm happy to say that we're kind of on this journey together and you know we have different projects with different styles that match each one of our sensitivities obviously with darko richards my solo project it's my solo project um, sure. i i kind of just do what i want to do 
with the exception of, again, joining some artists, mostly on vocals has been Cassandra, but also between albums, between uh, Into Orbit and now The Wicked. Last year, I did release three singles with one of them was actually with the same uh, singer and another one is with a, with a different singer. So that was me kind of, I, I feel it's easier to do that when I'm doing random singles. When I'm right. doing an album, I can get very, um, I don't, I don't want to say controlling, but I'm less likely to share the wealth for a solo Darker Richards album, if that makes sense. Sure, you, and, you have and, a vision. You have a very specific I vision. I have a very specific vision, and then I, I'm probably going to do more instrumental music where I'm just doing what I want to do, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Well, I mean, say, again, since we're speaking about the, the other projects, I want to say the um, My Friends and I, that album, Funky <laughs> Dreams and a Pinch of Synth, I love <laughs> that record so much. It's so much fun. <laughs> It has just got such a, such a happy vibe to it. It's, it's just a fun record. And I'm going to play a, a little clip here. This is the song Simplicity. I think it's my favorite track from <laughs> Funky Dreams and a Pinch of Synth. So can you talk a little bit about how that, how that song and, and really that album came to be? I got to tell you, uh, I mean, I'm definitely happy to talk about it. I'll tell you everything you want to tell. I didn't see this one coming, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. <laughs> and the only, and, and I'll tell you why, which answers your question at the same time, is Dark Richards, electronic rock, for the most part, kind of a serious vibe, right? Yeah. Chuparuba, alternative rock, for the most part, still kind of very different from my solo stuff, but still kind of rock aggressive, right? Right. My only other one, synth pop, but still kind of moody, right? And right. kind of dark, even though uh, not, not very rock, et cetera. Well, guess what? Through all these things, um, I have the, this need to do some music. Every once in a while, I get up and I'm happy, right? right. <laughs> Every once in a while. And I, and I want to do something funky. I want to do something that really I don't feel has a home in any of my other three projects. Right. Which I'll be honest with you. I see the other three projects as my three main projects. Right. Well, uh, over time, they started accumulating. It wasn't just a random track or two tracks or three tracks. And I did want to co collaborate with certain artists, again, that didn't fit into any of these other three. And at some point, I looked at it and I said, wait a minute, I, I have another album here. I do believe in some, some consistency for each um, artist. This doesn't fit in Dark Home. I only own one, True Baruba. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to call it my friend tonight. It's going to be almost the opposite of Dark Rages. It's very happy, funky, again, kind of outgoing music. And instead of being so controlling and just being by myself, it's going to be the opposite. It's a 180. So it's almost everything Dark Rages is not, right? right? Which is very healthy for me because it, with all my projects together now, I feel very satisfied and complete musically. I can almost write anything I want to write and it will fit one of those four projects, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, so, I, I mean, th that's what this is for me to a certain degree, because obviously I, mm -hmm. I host the ghost story guys podcast with Paul Bestel, but mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. sometimes you want to meet people and not talk about strange <laughs> things. You want to talk about other kinds of strange things, you know, you want to talk to strange guys, but not strange yeah. Things, Tom, yeah, you understand, you get it. <laughs> no, I hear you. So you completely understand. It's the same thing, right? You feel this need to do something very closely related to what you're doing already, but doesn't quite fit that. Right. I think you, what you're going through there is the exact same scenario. So that's how all my friends and I was born. That's how that album was born. Right. It wasn't something that I sat down and I said, I'm going to do this. It just kind of organically happened. And I said, this happened already. Let's throw it out there. And that's what it's going to be moving forward. Right. Uh, the other three projects, I do give it more attention. Right. But every once in a while, I have this stuff that doesn't fit there. It's a little too happy, a little too a beat, a little too funky. You're going there. I already got one <laughs> right. or two actually for the next album that, that are pocketed away for that. Oh, fantastic. So, I mean, as an in independent musician, and we talked a little bit th about this off air, the struggle in addition to, you know, again, building sort of a community of artists is, see, there seems to be a, uh, finding an audience, mm -hmm. you know, because like the internet has, yeah. yeah, I mean, the internet has democratized music to a certain degree. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's easier than ever to get your stuff online, but the, the sort of the, 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 um, the downside to that is everyone is online 
And it's hard to find amidst the chaff, good music. And of course you make great music. So I'm kind of curious, what's your, what's your process been like in terms of not raw numbers, but just in terms of finding your way to finding an audience? What, what has that been like for you? Yeah. I mean, if to be completely honest with you, I would love to not have to deal with that. Right. Oh, yeah. That's the honest, that's the honest answer yep. because I'm just, I'm, I'm a, I'm a producer a junkie. I just want to be in here. I want to do a mu- do music. That's kind of a, a necessity. Okay. I got to put it out there. Right. I got to try to network a little bit, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I, it's not exactly something I'm crazy about, to be honest with you. Having said that, honestly, uh, I've enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. Uh, okay. When I started doing it, I, I said, okay, I got to do this because it has to be done, but I've enjoyed it a little more. Um, now, and I'm not sure if this is uh, really in line with your question, but a struggle for me has been honestly actually signing on contracts when they have been sent my way with promises of bigger things. Uh, I can't tell you how many times this has happened now when I literally hold the pen and I want to sign on it. It'll sit there for days, for right. weeks, and I never end up signing it. Interesting. Um, I wondered I, if you'd been I, approached. Yeah, no, no, several times now. And I've had an issue, which sounds exciting in the beginning. I'm like, great, awesome. This is a label. And I don't want to name any names because, again, I didn't end up going with them. This is a label who uh, has an established uh, following for this certain type of music. Sure. This makes sense for this project. Let's go and do it. And, um, and then I can't seem to let go of the control, meaning th- even when you're having conversations such as, okay, you know, there's X amount of tracks here. I would like to release one or two singles. The way I like to do it, one, you know, a few singles before the album and then the album and this and that and get into details and you start feeling your control being like, no, yeah, maybe we'll do that. Maybe not. Maybe we'll do it on that day. Maybe not. And right. all of a sudden you become, that's just the way it is. So maybe I should let go of that control. Uh, maybe one day I will. <laughs> uh, and maybe I'll do so happily, but to this point, I haven't been able to take, to take that step. I do enjoy, um, having a, my specific plan. I want to release this single followed by that one on that day, by that one. And then the album, there is a certain pleasure, pleasure that comes with having control of when and how you are putting the music out. Absolutely. And, and I know uh, from sort of, I should say, uh, conversations with other artists, one of the, mm-hmm. some of whom have been signed. One of the struggles mm-hmm. is you, you really are at a disadvantage with mm-hmm. you, when you're signing with any label, doesn't matter how big they are, you know, because mm-hmm. they're sort of anticipating and banking on you being so keen to sign that you're not mm-hmm. really going to worry too much about your, about evaluating the contract and about your, yeah. your rights as an artist. And so of course to, to push back against any of that is, is very expensive. If you're going to have a lawyer revise the contract. And yep. to <laughs> been there. Yeah, there you go. And mm-hmm. so that, that must be again, really tough, especially for someone like yourself, who's sort of a, a soup to nuts artist who, you know, kind of puts everything together, I- including the visual package. Um, and that's something I really admire about your stuff. You know, you, not only do you have the audio locked, but you have a very strong visual presence with your work. Mm. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh yeah. No, I mean, I noticed, uh, with your, when you started releasing sing, uh, singles for Into Orbit, I noticed you were using artwork from the artist Lumi, who I'm a big fan of. Mm-hmm. And now with, with some of the videos you've had out, they're really slick and well-produced and, and same for the promo clips. How is it mm-hmm. sort of you, you've come to that? With, it's been a combination of, number one, I've been fortunate to have my brother's a filmmaker, right? Oh, okay. So there's that. For example, he did uh, my first video searching for... Uh, Point of the uh, point of departure, right? So I have my brother. I, he did the artwork for Into Orbit. Um, he's been heavily involved in a lot of the stuff that I do, and I'm just that's just you know I'm lucky to have a brother who's a filmmaker and it's in, in multimedia. Sure. However, um, there are certain things, for especially with the um, style of music that I've been developing, especially now with the Wicked, where I wanted very I knew exactly what I wanted in terms of whether artwork or videos or what or what not. Um, and I have worked with um, other artists, visual artists, especially for the artworks uh, for recent albums. I found uh, another artist um, for Into Orbit. Like you said, I, I use some of Lumi's. But then for this one, I fell in love with, uh, he's called Miko is his first name. He's out in Greece. And oh, wow, okay. um, it was one of those where I landed on his page and said, that's the wicked. And I reached out to him and I told him, Miko, 
I'm not asking you to. I am forcing you. I know you don't know me. <laughs> you must do my artwork for the wicked because it's the specific type of sensitivity and style that um, your visual style is what I hear when I when I'm doing my music visually. So in some cases, I reached out to artists like like him. Let me go for the videos I, for the videos for this new album, My Views Left Studio. A gentleman out in um, Israel actually. And that's oh, one wow. of the beautiful things about, about today's so where I can use to work with somebody in Greece, somebody in Israel. Absolutely. Um, by the way, for, for some help on the mixing and definitely for the mastering, I use DHS um, mastering who's out in Armenia. So it, it's oh, very, wow. it's literally a globe wide uh, collaboration that I have now with a team, the way I feel about it. Right. And um, so depending on the need, I go out to different artists. Hey, look uh, for left studio. I kind of have this idea for this video. Can you put this together? And he does a wonderful job of putting that together so that it goes in line again with the concept of the album or the specific uh, message that I want to get across from that song. So it's a collaborative effort from different artists in different parts of the world will be the short answer. Fair. And again, it it combines to form a a hell of a package. Now, what have some of the challenges been in terms of working that way? Has there been anything that you've sort of found... Uh, is a little more frustrating because you used to you used to play in bands uh, for mm-hmm. uh, sort of in and around the in Florida, correct? Yeah, I'm in, I'm in South Florida. I'm in Miami, the Miami area, essentially. Right. Okay. So, have you found have there been any disadvantages with the, again sort of engaging online compared to what you used to do, kind of performing live, having people in the room with you? No. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. No. 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 Uh, as a matter of fact. Um, I think for a control freak like me, right, um, right. It's, it's actually been beneficial. The computer doesn't talk back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so true. No, I, I, no, and I shouldn't say that because if I say that, it comes off as, well, he's probably impossible to work with and et cetera. That's not even what I mean. I've actually been very fortunate um, to have just beautiful people in my life, great musicians. I usually am the band leader, usually, not always. Right. Uh, I've had some exceptions. And I've had great, great people that I've had the pleasure to work with um, in a room. And honestly, that wasn't the problem. It's just that being in the studio here, on the contrary, you're asking me if I've had any difficulties. It's been the opposite because really there's no limit to any ideas that I can have. Of course. But when I'm in a room with musicians, no matter how good they are, you're working with those pieces, right? You're in a five-piece band and a six-piece band and a, right. and a trio or whatever. You, those are human beings playing short instruments. That's what you're, that's, that's it. Those are your pieces. Do your best with that. Here, I can put a cello on a synth, on a piano. Um, I can't really play the piano, but I can compose it. I can compose the synths. You know, if you can compose, you can tell the computer everything you want to do. And right. it does it for you. So no, on the contrary, man, I wouldn't say any difficulties. If anything, it's been liberating. And if anything, I realized when I started down on this path, point of departure, I should have always been doing this. This right. is really where I'm at home. This is really me. Uh, I enjoy playing in a band. Don't get me wrong. Um, there are days where I kind of miss that live feeling, but very little and definitely not enough to draw me back to it, to be honest with you. So no, I feel like I'm home now. Um, maybe I have more frustrations and difficulties before I was doing what I'm doing now. Interesting. And do you mm-hmm. ever foresee a future where any of your projects say, I mean, a Chuparuba might be like the most obvious candidate mm-hmm. for this but like sort of doing uh playing live do you ever see that happen yeah yeah i get that i get that question all the time um yes i like to, i would like to play live with all all the projects here's the thing though right um as opposed to many other musicians who enjoy the let's get the show on the road no matter what struggles come in they just enjoy that right i i get more pleasure out of composing again right, right. so I, I will put the show on the road but it has to be the right offer, the right label, going back to that conversation, right? Um, the right tour, whatever, whatever it needs to be where I, I say, okay, it's a set deal. This is what's going to happen from month, you know, X to month X. And the whole thing is real nicely planned. Now I don't want to just, um, Hey, let's get the band together. Let's kind of put a show on the road and see what happens because right. it is very time consuming. Sure. It is hard work to put the life thing together. Absolutely. I can do it, but that's time then that I'm not composing new music. And I just get a lot more pleasure out of this, to be honest with you. Of course. And, and I mean, I must imagine, we, and we, we won't get too personal, but you know, you, you have, you have kids and you have, you mm-hmm, have I other work and you have other work that demands your attention. Mm-hmm. So you must have a, a limited amount of, 
minutes to draw from in a day. I mean, that you manage to accomplish mm-hmm. what you do already is is crazy impressive and a little annoying. I'll be honest. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I actually get that comment now and then from uh, fellow musicians, so I take it as a compliment. <laughs> it very much is absolutely. I mean, that's pretty much it. There, you're right. You hit it right on the nail. I do have limited time, so that time needs to go to what gives me the most joy. Yeah. Right. And the most joy is composing a new song. That's what's going to happen. I'm kind of curious, you know, in, and I'm, I'm all over the place here. This is my brain at work. In the music industry for a very long time, there have been very clear indicators of success. You know, there have been, you know, for like a gold record or a platinum record or a diamond record, mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. like this. But obviously the goalposts have, I, I feel like they've shifted. I mean, I, I think those things are still happening. But, mm-hmm. you know, the, the number of artists, selling those numbers have really, I think, decreased, you know? And so what to you, what is a marker of success now when you release, say when the wicked comes out, what to you makes you think this was a success, successful release of this album? I mean, obviously Mm -hmm. you being satisfied with it is a huge part of it, but in terms of audience response, what, Mm -hmm. what makes you feel like, yeah, this landed? Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, we, we live in a time of, uh, streams. Let's be honest, right? That's sure. something that cannot be ignored, right? So there's Absolutely. that. Um, how is it? At least we're living in a time of playlists, of streams. How is it performing in those? How well is it be, being accepted um, by those big playlists, et cetera, et cetera? So that's something that has to be taken into consideration. But for me personally, where I'm planning to go here, um, I'm focused on the release now, but right after that, and this is something that uh, fellow musicians or even non musicians have been telling me for some time. I've had it on the back of my mind, but it's, I feel like now is the right time is I will focus on getting this music or, or any other music that I do on, on sync deals on television. Because again, there's a reason why when describing my music, I start with the word cinematic. The music is very cinematic. Um, I'm constantly being told this sounds like something I would hear in a movie, in a video game. Um, much so. It sounds based from your um, reaction. sounds like you agree. And um, so I'm actually going to focus more on that because I do think that, First, it makes sense for the music. And second, that might actually be a more uh, natural way for me to find a larger audience. Um, sure. Because my music is not something that you're going to find on FM radio. You know, it's just not. You don't find electronic cinematic music instrumental on top of it uh, <laughs> on radio usually, right? You find it on video games. You find it on films, on shows, that sort of thing. So I think that's going to be a way for me moving forward. I've always wondered, how, how do you begin that process? What does that look like? Well, I mean, actually, these, these days we have what they're called libraries, sync libraries. Okay. Okay. And sync libraries are essentially the middleman between the artist and the television, not even the show, the, the television company or, or, or film company. Okay. Mm-hmm. Essentially, you go and you submit your music to these uh, sync libraries and they match it with the right content or the people that need that music. It's really a really nice it's kind of effective for all parties involved. Matter of right. fact, that's how Chupa, Chupa Ruba was literally born out of that, right? Really? Chupa Ruba, yeah, that's how literally it was born. Chupa Ruba was Maestro Manny, uh, my colleague. You know, Chupa Ruba is two of us, uh, me and Manny. And uh, Manny does a lot of movie for film. He has, unlike me, focused on that. Although I do cinematic music, I do it because it gives me, I do what I want to do, sure. as opposed to let me write a piece for that show that's asking for that song, right? Right. Well, Manny does a lot of that, and one day he reached out to uh, to myself, and at the time I still had a live band, um, and to the drummer that I was using at the time, and he said, listen, I got this show, I believe it was from Bravo. I might be wrong, because he, he did a lot of music for Bravo, Discovery Channel, a couple of other channels, but um, they need something punk rock. It's a show about cars in the 70s from Detroit, okay. and they need something kind of punk rock. Uh, let's do a couple of songs. Well, we did a couple of songs. They got accepted on the show. To this day, I still get a, a few dollars here and there. Even oh, though nice. Years ago, apparently, they still show some reruns. Um, and we had so much fun that we said, why don't we do 12, 13 songs and release an album? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we are now working on album number three. So oh, that's, that's how Chupa Rua was born. It was born out of a, a sync company requesting a specific style of music that we had too much fun with. And it kind of turned into another project and a sort of band, even if it's a two-man show. And uh, for for audience, I'm going to play a little clip from my favorite Chuparuba song. This is "Give Me Fire" from their self-titled debut <laughs> album. So 
So we, we've talked about, we've talked about Chuparubu. We've talked about my friends and I, we've talked about Darko Richards. The last one really, we haven't talked much about. And to be honest, I actually don't know. This is the one I know the least about is my mm-hmm. only other one. Mm-hmm. And so, um, can you give me a, just a little bit of background on that and sort of where that, where that comes from and, and what that kind of, uh, yeah, how that, how that got off the ground and what that means to you. My only other one. So I'm actually trying, I'm actually struggling to remember the birth of it. Um, to be quite honest, because this is another good friend of mine. In this case, Alicia is fantastic singer, very soulful, very jazzy, jazzy, very uh, R&B ish. Um, so definitely different flavors of anything else we talked to about this point or about my other projects. Uh, we met, we became uh, good friends. We wanted to collaborate on something, but again, totally different styles, right? Sure. They didn't quite happen right away, but something was there. Eventually, it, we got together. I said, look, why don't you come over? Let's get in a room together, as opposed to doing it the old way, the way up to the point we had done of like, let's get a band or whatever the case might be. I have this thing going on now. This, this was early on when I kind of uh, became a, a studio uh, a junkie. And let's just do something together and see what happens. Uh, she came over. We, we did a song. And it kind of sat there for a couple of months. But then things started happening in here. Right. And, um, and, I, and I started hearing in my head, okay, I, I, I think I found where I can put a lot of myself. And yet it's very, very fitting for Elise's style of vocals, right? Because I'm not a jazz guy. I'm not an RB guy. And I realized this dark synth pop flavor um, was very close to me. And yet it had the sensitivities needed for her to do what she does on vocals. Right. And that's exactly what happened. I, I did a couple of songs. I sent it to her and I said, you want to lay vocals on that? She got super excited. It was it. It, was, it felt right for both of us. And from there on, it's been smooth. It's now we have kind of a sound, a style. Again, it's very, I say synth pop. Um, I, I do struggle to describe that one. Right. Um, it's the best way I can put it, indie pop, synth pop, whatever you want to call it. But it's definitely not as aggressive. It's not as dark. And it's definitely more vocal centric. So I do uh, compose the music and I send to her for the lead vocals. But I always keep in mind, I am composing this for vocals. I'm right. not letting this get away and turn into a darker, richer thing. Um, so it, it, again, going back to what I said earlier, it satisfies a certain need in me that I cannot satisfy with any other project. Sure. And Elise's has a certain, just I can't, I can't uh, say enough beautiful things about, uh, in my opinion of her vocals, a certain sensitivity and style that I don't get from any of my other endeavors. Um, so when I have that mood, I say, okay, I got to put this song and I know this has to go to her and it's going to hit all the right spots. Not sure if I answered you in a, in a clean, nice, uh, <laughs> coherent way. Absolutely. <laughs> but that, yeah, that's the best I can give you. And we're going to share a little bit of one of their tracks with our listeners now. This is Sorrows Into Flowers. You and I will never be. All right, so we've talked about the past. We've talked about where you're at now. What comes next for Darko Richards? Obviously, we've got The Wicked. It'll be out by the time this airs because I'm not sure when this podcast mm-hmm. will launch. But uh, what, what comes next for you? I'm very OCD. I'm very organized. So I do have a very specific sequence here, uh, right. a very specific plan, especially when, you know, when you're producing for four different projects. And honestly, even more. To be honest with you, once I finished The Wicked a couple of months back, in the time of preparation, for the artwork, videos, release, you know, there is a time of preparation for that sort of stuff. What I have been doing is catching up with, uh, I don't want to say promises, promises is too big of a word, but other artists that we haven't discussed that I produce for. Um, so I've been catching up with that. Uh, funk stuff for Lena, who's also a very good friend of mine. A few, you know, from Funky Dream and a Pinch of Sin for my mm-hmm. friends. Um, the sax player, I okay. produce for her as well. I produce oh, for, her, for her and- solo releases. Interesting. And so there's one coming up, is there? Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot more than one coming up. So okay. I've had her on the back burner for a little bit. I've been telling her, Lena, I'm sorry, I'm going to get to you. I got to get this wicked out of my system because I'm in a certain place, a certain mood, and yourself is exactly the opposite of that. Right. So I have been almost, um, it's been therapeutic 
coming out of the wicked's darkness <laughs> over the right. last few weeks, uh, <laughs> doing some funky stuff for her. So I'm getting that out of the way. And then next I'm turning over to my only other one to start working on the second album. And Chuparuba is always ongoing. Chuparuba is not, it's the only project where I don't do in a sequence where I say, I'm going to do Darko Richards. I'm going to do my only other one, my friends and I. Chuparuba is me and Manny. Um, hey, let's get together this Saturday. Let's get together, you know, on whatever day. Let's work on another track. So that's always ongoing. That's also, you know, coming up. So basically I have all of those projects are in the works for more music plus random artists, not random, but other artists outside of those four, like Lena that I'm currently working on. Very cool. And I, I have to ask for myself, is there any hope of a physical release at any point in the future? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I like to, um, you're not the first one to ask me that. Oh, I'm, I'm not um, surprised. Especially, yeah. Especially the vinyl thing has gotten so, uh, hot over the last couple of years. I don't know if that started to die down. I actually recently read, I don't, oh, know, I don't follow too, I don't, I don't follow that too closely. God knows it might've been just a, a wrong article that I read, but in any case, I would say yes. I would say yes. I don't want to make any promises. I don't know when exactly, but I think we are getting to the point where I need to uh, do some physical releases. It's funny, man. Uh, a lot of interesting things are being uh, done. Um, you have artists that are doing the vinyls. I've seen CDs all of a sudden. And then for those that really do the, the 80s thing, they're putting out cassettes, which that's is wild to me, man. I haven't seen a cassette player in years. That's what actually I'm glad you said that because the cassette itself is not the problem. It is awesome. Where am I playing this? <laughs> like where, where I have I haven't had one myself in forever, so I guess it's a very niche uh, community. Obviously, very it's a few cats out there that do this, but even that's becoming a thing. So yes, I, I would expect physical releases soon. I just don't know exactly how soon. Well, fair enough. It's, it's something something for us to uh, to look forward to. Um, before we wrap up, I'm just kind of curious: who are you listening to right now? Do you listen to a lot of a lot of other artists while you're working, or do you find that sort of pollutes the process a bit? Oh, no, no, no. I, I love listening to the artists. Um, believe it or not, I listen to more uh, film composers. Oh, right? interesting. Oh, of course. Yeah, I saw you uh, posted I, the uh, the cover for uh, Hans Zimmer's Interstellar a little while back is on Instagram. My favorite album, composition, whatever you want to call it, ever. Dude, it's right? so it's the only soundtrack I own on vinyl. I love okay. <laughs> the Interstellar soundtrack. It, yeah. It, it, honestly, yep. I, I, I tear up every time. It's so I evocative. Do too, I I do as well. I, I I um if we if we stay on this topic for like ten minutes, I might start crying right on the show. Um, <laughs> I'm exaggerating. <laughs> I'm exaggerating, but that's a very special um album to me. I don't know what to call it an album. It's you know film, whatever you want to call it. Sure. Um, and just Z Zimmer as a whole, honestly. Uh, Hans, I'm a big Hans Zimmer fan. He's the number my number one go to that I listen to the most. Um, actually, his life in Vienna. He did a, a live show a couple of years back. I don't know if you saw it. No. He's done a couple. He's done a couple in recent years. I mean, obviously, he's not an artist that goes on tours, but he will put together an orchestra and some friends, and he'll put on a show once every four or five years. Okay. And there's a live in Vienna show that I cannot tell you how much that's influenced me, the right. impact that's had on me, how and how much I find myself going back to it like in a stellar. So I listen to a lot of Zimmer. I listen to a lot of Danny Elfman. Oh, yeah. Um. Uh, so a lot of film composers, the splat, a lot of guys like that. And then, I mean, there's some that I have been listening to for 20 years and I'll keep listening to forever. Your tool, you know, I'm a big sure. tool fan, stuff like that. And then there's a whole lot of synth, um, you know, recent years, the whole synth wave thing, dark synth, whatever you want to call it. There's so many different uh, adjectives to describe that stuff or, or, or generalists, I should say. I'm a big Carpenter Brut fan. He has oh, inspired absolutely. me. Absolutely. Yeah. He's my favorite of the whole group. Um, but you know, it's hard for me to say about a specific artist or a specific genre. Usually what ends up happening with me is I discover an artist and I say, wow, I've discovered this whole new genre that I love. And not really, it's just one or two guys or ladies from that field that I love and one or two Absolutely. guys or ladies from that field that I love. And it sounds like, you know what I mean? Yeah. I found that with synth, to be honest, I really got heavy into synth. And then I realized mm -hmm. it's not that I'm into synth wave exactly. It's that I, I'll mm -hmm. find a handful of artists who I really vibe with. And mm -hmm. really like, and then there's a lot of stuff that, you know, if you put it on, I'll listen to it, but mm -hmm. it, it doesn't stand out artistically. You know, it doesn't stand sure. out like, like say like your, like your stuff grabbed me because there was such clear vision behind it, you know, whereas, Thank you. Thank so, you. Oh, no, absolutely. Uh, but sometimes that's, that's not the case. And it's yep. not that it's bad. It's just, I mm -hmm. think, I think people do that thing with synth where they think, well, anyone can make this. 
and mm -hmm. you know they can't that's that's just not how it works that's you know <laughs> that's not how it works um for me personally I, I you know like many others like yourself i thought i fell in love with synthway uh, a few years back and then i realized no I, I i'm so happy this is here in our lives it's bringing so much uh pleasure to us but it's just a few artists that i love and then specifically i can't just do that type of music that's actually yeah. something that's hurt me to be honest with you um, I believe it. Yeah. I can't tell you. Yeah. Okay. I can't tell you how much feedback I've gotten from people. Like, this is great. I just, what, it, what is it? This is not synth wave, even though it has synth. Uh, this yeah. is not rock, even though it's rock. And that's actually what I'm most proud of. <laughs> sure. And yet, because you can't put it in a box um, and, a, and it doesn't fit my playlist, yep. or it doesn't fit, uh, you know, this, whatever the case might be, it's actually something that's hurt me. I, I got frustrated maybe that for a day or two. And right. then I've, I've learned to embrace that. And I'm, I love it. I do what I do because I love it. And if I get a little bit of Zimmer here and a, lot of, a little bit of Brut here and a little bit of Tool here, and then it sounds like Dr. Richards, hey, so be it. Yeah. I know um, a friend of mine, Steve from uh, Hexagram, he, mm -hmm. his last album was uh, Crystal Lake. And it was a real, actually, he was inspired by Interstellar as well in some of his stuff. And mm -hmm. you can really hear it in some of his organ compositions. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. um, it, it really, yeah, the, the way it was received suffered from it not fitting into any one synth category. You know, we managed to get a couple tracks on playlists, but it was mm -hmm. never the stuff that he would send in. You know, there was one or two that sounded synthier. And so that's, yep, yep. Th that's what made the playlists. But the tracks, you know, he really, really loved. It was, <laughs> it was just not those ones getting picked up. Man, do I know that? Yeah, that's the <laughs> same thing that's happened to me. Actually, right down the, the T, like it's, um, hey man, great stuff. But actually this track, I don't know why you didn't send it to me. That that's actually very whatever, uh, yep. very synth eighties. Okay, awesome. I did it. Thank you. Get it. Um, but um, the tracks that are more special to me are probably the ones that um, refuse to be uh, put in a box of a specific genre, right? And and I'm, that's why I love them because they have a little bit of uh, film composition and they have a little bit of rock and this and that. But hey, it is what it is. I'm, I don't let that get to me. I really don't. Um, I, I'm almost happy that that's the case now. Yeah. Absolutely. Because again, it, it makes you stand out, even though it may not fit into, fit into a box and it may be a little, uh, not harder sell, but you have to work a little harder to find your audience. It just makes yeah. for a, a much more unique and frankly memorable piece of art at the end of it all. So I, I think it's, I it's worth the struggle. Darko Man, thank you so much for taking the time. I, this has been t tons of fun getting to know you. Where can, uh, where can folks find you online? Where can they find the wicked? Uh, just pimp all your stuff as much as possible no honestly it's pretty easy if you google darko richards i'm coming up fortunately <laughs> right? this is true very um, unique name yeah it, it's very it's very simple darko richards uh, i do put my music um on all major streaming platforms whether it's your spotify your itunes um it's also in your band camps on your sound clouds anywhere you listen to music you should be able to find me if you put darko richards uh i'm not sure i haven't tried the wicked i'm assuming there's going to be more one more than one wicked before so maybe <laughs> that one <laughs> won't be as easy um but you can find me wherever you listen to music uh, you know even your youtube of course um if you google darko richards and you should be able to get to me and listen to your preferred streaming platform it's the best way i can put it perfect and if you check the show notes you'll find links to all of his stuff you'll find links to where you can pick up the wicked where you can stream it i mean if you can folks always buy music from independent artists it makes a difference you know the difference in royalties between a stream and a purchase is substantial. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we don't like to say that, uh, you know, as artists, we're doing it for the money because we do it for the love of what we're doing, but the money helps. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. it, it, buying independent music is voting with your dollars. It's telling an artist, mm -hmm. I like this. I value this. Please make more of this. And so if you can, please, please, uh, buy a copy of, well, really support independent artists, period. And, uh, mm -hmm. make sure you listen to the wicked. Thank you, Ren. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure being here with you. Um, just an honor to have this conversation with you. You're a fantastic person. You do fantastic work yourself. Oh. So I am honored and very thankful to have spent uh, this time with you. Oh, thanks, man. Well, thank I really appreciate that. And that's the ball game. Thanks so much to Darko Richards for being my first guest here on Largely the Truth. It was a real, real good time getting to know him properly. Again, you can find his new album, The Wicked, everywhere you stream your music. But you can buy a copy at darkorichards.bandcamp.com. Thanks for joining me here on my first episode. I hope you enjoyed yourself. 
If you did and you want to get early access to the next episodes, you want ad-free episodes, or if you want to hear any of the extra little bits of conversation that are cut from the main show, for example, uh, Darko and I had an additional, I think, 15-minute conversation about film soundtracks that happened after we had turned off the main recording. You want to hear any of that stuff, head on over to patreon.com slash largely the truth, where $2 a month gets you in the door. Now you might be thinking, hey, that's pretty fucking cheeky. It's your first episode and you got a Patreon already. And my answer to that is, yes, sir. I sure as hell do. And if you can't afford to support the show financially, I more than understand. Times are hard. The world is an uncertain place right now. So uh, not a problem. Listening is a huge help. And if you want to do me a real solid, rate and review the show anywhere you can. iTunes, any other place that allows for podcast reviews. And tell your friends. There's nothing quite like word of mouth to help a show grow. If you have a comment for the show, you can reach me at largelythetruth at gmail.com. One last thing, huge thanks to Peter Pizzanta Music for my fabulous theme song. You can find more from him by searching for Pizzanta Music wherever you get your tunes. And of course, thank you for listening. Without you folks, there wouldn't be much point. All right. Until next time, I hope the night takes you to the same strange and wonderful places it takes me. And remember, if you're not sure what comes next, put a call out into the dark. You never know who's going to pick up. I'll see you next time.